Someone who is three-fourths Massa and one-quarter Coon. Obama is a mulatto, that's the one-drop rule fades through the American conscience. And maybe my story is just a little too honest. I'm black and proud, I'm black and proud. I'm just as white as that Mona Lisa. I'm just as black as my cousin Keisha. I'm biracial, so bye Felicia. I don't want to see on your phone that you have an album called Parents and Grandparents to show me that you're black. Wrap it. Uh, if you have to, if you have to tell me what race you are because I can't see it, I don't want to go into a Blue's Clues mystery case observation to know what race you are when race is phenotypical. When race is phenotypical, race is how you are perceived. Sometimes it don't make no sense. Does it really have to? There is nothing I can say. Hi, welcome to Maya's world. Hi y'all, my name is Mayowa, and on my platform we discuss things around texturism, colorism, and featureism. Today's topic is going to be about the one drop rule, which by proxy is colorism. So y'all, I feel like we have lost the plot. I feel like we have lost the plot. I feel like this Black History Month, I don't know what it is, but the amount of things that have gone viral that have relativity to the one drop rule is unreal. For those who don't know, the one drop rule is a race science that says that if you have a drop of blood, you are now officially black. So when we discuss the one drop rule, I think it's really important to talk about sympathy and empathy. I feel like discussions around one drop rule or people who are white passing gets a lot of sympathy from not only white people, but black people. And I'm going to discuss how it moves in different ethnic groups. So when I talk about the sympathy that people get for one drop rule, this is where we get the trope of the tragic mulatto. So I'm reading this directly from Wikipedia, but it says the female tragic Octoroon was a stock character of abolitionist literature, a light skinned woman raised in her father's household as though she was white until his bankruptcy or death reduces her to a menial position and she's eventually sold. And so the reason that I say this garnishes sympathy is because, so back when the tragic mulatto trope became popular in media, people would look at this person like white people would look and they'd be like oh this person looks like me they shouldn't be subjected to harm and so that was like kind of the that was the push of why that happened and then by proxy black people also started to say oh wow it must be so hard for you to look white but still have the hardships of some of us black people and then the sympathy came that way but within the tragic mulatto trope and what we see going on today is that there is a lot of blaming or equally blaming of black people for the oppression of white passing people, which is incredibly false. One of the tropes within this whole tragic mulatto aesthetic is to say that black people were bullying me just as much as white people were or black people made my life just as hard as white people. Black people do not have any kind of systemic oppression to, do, to people who are passing as white or who are white. We cannot oppress white people. So we cannot oppress you. And I feel that there's actually so much space within the black community for um, people who do pass as white and even people who are mixed race and even people who are light skin. Colorism is a discrimination of dark skin people. So by proxy, it is the uplifting of light skin people. So if the lighter you are in black communities, the more sympathy people will have for you, the more empathy people will have for you, the more people will see you as um, correct or right or and, and and you know we can also admit that anti-black racism is this idea that black people are innately bullies and black people are innately mean and jealous and angry and the darker you are the more likely people are going to think you're mean you're jealous you're angry which is often why if you've ever seen like tv shows where a mixed race person described like getting bullied the people who they usually would be like is like she's dark skin she has kinky hair she has nappy hair and she bullied me because my hair was long all of that stuff so not to be funny, but it seemed like always little black nappy headed. I'm sorry, y'all, but it seemed like always little nappy headed girls would bully me. Like they'd be jealous or something. Like because what? Um, because society is going to want to uplift people who have looser hair anyway. Society is wanna, going to want to uplift people who have lighter skin anyway. And I'm not saying that you getting bullied for having looser hair texture didn't hurt your feelings, but we should be able to see in the grand scheme of things, you, if you have looser hair, you will be fine. Society will still uplift you. And that's the difference between an individual person feeling hurt versus a systemic oppression. So like now we're going to get into the reviewing element where we're going to watch some of the most unbearable 
uh, Tragic Mulatto Media, and we're going to give him my review. Um, let me find it. This clip um, of this poet who is mixed race, and sh I guess this is from a documentary. I saw that it was released a couple years ago, but it's going viral right now. And is it is of someone talking, I think it's called the, sorry, I think it's called the, the Quadrant Confessions. So let's have a look. Someone who is three-fourths Massa and one-quarter Coon. Obama is a mulatto. That's the one drop rule. <sighs> wow. Talk about an entrance. The one drop rule fades through the American conscience. And maybe my story is just a little too honest. I'm Mark Osborne, Maya's dad. We actually had a nickname for her, the Amazing Maya. That, that nickname, I don't know, maybe she was a couple years old and probably came out. And I still think it applies more than ever now. A little too harsh a reminder of civil rights false promises. A little too bright is the light in my skin that sheds light upon what lactification trauma is. These are the confessions of a quadroon. Confessions of a Quadroon is absolutely um, my most well-known piece of work and my most requested by family and friends. Someone who, who changes colors based on the racial makeup of the room. Which is beautiful because um, it is a poem about me taking ownership of my racial identity, which is something that I have struggled with and will continue to struggle with every day of my life. The only time I've been mixed up in my race is in the world's haste to put me in a category. There have been countless moments because of my coloring that I have, that my black experience has been negated by others. And I have been told that I cannot live a black, I, that I'm not black, that I cannot live a black experience. So like, you know, she said that so, these people didn't think she was black. And it's like, I don't, I feel that if you know how you present in the world, you should not be offended by that. Being offended by that is actually a privilege because it means that there's another reality you could be living where people are not perceiving you as black. And we all know what happens with the reality where you are not perceived as black. You have privileges. It's almost like being offended that somebody thought you were uh, rich. It's like, babe, it's, I'm not going to feel bad for someone who thinks someone has money. I'm not going to feel bad for someone who looks white and people are saying is white. I don't know. I feel like it's just really detached. I really hope that this person is no longer performing that piece. And I know some of y'all are going to say, well, Maya, if they can't do it at the spoken word, where can they do it? You know where they can do it, babes? At therapy. You should not expect people who have less privilege than you to be the people who console you. You should not. Not only do you, should you be doing it at therapy, you should be doing it with family members. You should be doing it with people who have the capacity to hold space. It should not be assumed that because I am black, I must be able to hold space for you and your racial panic. I'm not doing that. And I think it's okay to not do that. I think it's okay to put your foot down and be like, this kind of poetry is actually really unbearable and I don't like it. And no, I'm not oppressive to white logic. And no, I'm not oppressive to a white passing or a white person because I don't like it. But when we talk about empathy of like people who are often marginalized in blackness, like a lot of times it just goes down to the lightest person because there are people who are bi-ethnic and, and actually have so much struggle within being bi-ethnic, but they're not given sympathy or empathy and they can't really use that as like a personality trait. I have so much empathy for bi-ethnic people because I feel like growing up in a two different cultures of blackness is not easy. And I feel like, you know, I would love to see a movie that has someone who is half Jamaican, half Nigerian, half um, Eritrean, half Ghanaian, half uh, South African, half African-American. Like these are the kind of, you know, but we don't have these kinds of people that we hold space for, especially if they're dark skin. I think that people don't really care for the multitudes of ways that bi-ethnic people show up in the world and show up within blackness and are able to kind of understand both sides of things in complex ways. Like I think a lot of bi-ethnic people have a deep understanding of how diaspora wars are like happening and why it's going on. And you know, we, I don't see those voices being at the center or at the forefront of these diaspora conversations, but I do see people who are mixed race. I do see people who are one fourth black, being at the forefront of talking about blackness. We have seen so many, you know, a lot of grants, a lot of TV shows, a lot of media is centered around this. And I think it's because we are taught to have sympathy and empathy towards whiteness. Mixed race people are a growing minority. So I don't understand why like that 
closure and that understanding doesn't come from other mixed race people. I remember when I was in college, I had a friend and she's mixed race and every person that she always dated was also mixed race. And I remember at the time I was like, oh, that's kind of strange. You know, I was like, why does she only date mixed race people, especially because she hangs out with black people. And then I talked to her and she was like, because mixed race people understand my struggle. And I said, actually, that makes sense. Like there's something that I... I don't want to give that to someone. I don't want to have to understand that. And I think that a lot of people get into, a lot of people have children and they are mixed race and they don't think about how these things can affect them and how like them trying to be one race or another race is also going to create a lot of racial panic and how just teaching people that it's okay to, it's okay to be mixed. It's not a slur. (laughs) It's okay to say you're this and that, like, that's fine. I think we all know who's like at the forefront of this um, biracial panic or it's not even biracial, one-fourth panic is going to be logic, right? So let's watch some of the things that logic has made. And like, to be honest, I'm not sure, I'm gonna double check, but I feel like logic has said the N-word in his music. And logic is a white person. Logic, and the fact that, you know, the only way that logic was able to get to the position that he was was because there must've been some black people who co-signed him along the way. And whoever those black people are, call them out. We need them at the forefront because what, what is going on over here? This person, this man has all of the privileges to oppress me. If a police pulls me and this man over, do you feel like they're going to be like, oh, you two blacks? No, they're not. They're not. Only one of us will be black and one of us will be the white man. Like, this is just pathetic. But yeah, let's get into it. Fucking no. See, I'm half white and half Negro. Papa was a black man. Mama was a racist. I'm not. You ain't black. You a motherfucking white boy. But my beautiful black brothers and sisters want to act like I'm adopted. I'm black and white, but racism I still cannot evade. Somebody pinch me. Black man screaming, trying to convince me I'm not black. So why the white man want to lynch me? Growing up, she called me. The kids call me cracker. Did you know I'm mixed like Obama? What is... What is wild to me about Logic is Logic's dad is mixed race. So wait, what you saying? You don't like mixed race people? No, nah, man, I'm mixed race people. How can I not like myself? And my whole thing is that if you are black and you really want, and it's so important for you to have black children, like that is the most important thing for you, then maybe you should marry someone or reproduce with someone who's black. Like, I don't feel like... And if you are holding on for your blackness for dear life, if you are 50% and you are with somebody who is 100% Caucasian, why did you think that that child would be a super Negro, huh? Because I, listen, math is not my strong point, but I feel like this, like this, this math should make sense to many people. If you are 50% white and you get with a 100% white person, your child is now going to be 25% white. There are so many Africans and African-Americans who do their DNA and will find out that they're 25% white. So then I also want to like even bring in is the amount of Africans who do also find out that they have Arab ancestry or white ancestry. And the gag is someone can be 25% white if they do their DNA ancestry and still be dark skinned. But you know what? We can never claim white. You know why? Because we don't have privilege to claim white. But it's interesting that when someone is 25% black, they can claim black if they want because they have privilege to be listened to. They have privilege to be heard. And people enjoy seeing white people as the image of blackness. And like, it just really gets me because I feel like if you have to start bringing out pictures of your parents, wrap it up, wrap it up. If you have to, if you have to tell me what race you are because I can't see it, wrap it up. I don't wanna go into a Blue's Clues mystery case observation to know what race you are when race is phenotypical. When race is phenotypical, race is how you are perceived. I don't want to see on your phone that you have an album called Parents and Grandparents to show me that you're black. And God forbid I'm an ancestor and I find out my child is using photos of me to prove to their friends that they're black. Wrap it up. I don't want to be used like that. I don't know what's going on. I know right now he's doing a, doing this um, interview where he's talking to his dad, who is mixed race, and he's like processing a lot. And I think I saw like a clip and he was talking about how his dad wasn't there. And I was like, wait, hold on a minute. So your dad wasn't that present for you growing up. So you was probably 100% raised by your white mother. 
and you are claiming black. And I find that to be wild because what about the woman who pushed you out? Like, I also feel like there's something strange about erasing the person who literally brought you into this world or the other parent that you constantly hide. Like, <laughs> she raised you. That's your mom's. But yeah, let me know what you think. If you made it to the end, let me know if you like my makeup. I feel like it, it reminds me of a book cover. Was there this book called The Gilded Something? I'm going to see if I can find it, but it, I was inspired by this book. See, and this is my makeup. <laughs> you already know what to do. If you guys have been to my channel, you already know I love compliments on my look. Um, let me know what you think. Thanks for watching. Have a great day. Bye.